Jeff Myers, I'm with the Technology Transfer Program here at the University, and uh, my role in this next segment is to introduce our five speakers, which will they will speak for a, about 15 minutes each on their uh, technological uh, opportunities and advances that they have. And I might add that all of our speakers have posters on display, which provides additional information in the atrium and tables. Uh, with additional information uh, with uh, uh, staff available to talk to you about these opportunities so should you be interested in getting more information. Our first speaker today is Dr. Kathleen Campbell from the Southern Illinois School of Medicine in Springfield. She is the uh, a professor and the director of audiology research at the School of Medicine and she's going to talk about demethionine as a protective agent. Campbell? environment to be an inventor. Uh, I was a clinical audiologist for many years, did, did my PhD, got into research. Uh, as a clinician, I saw patients with hearing losses, side effects of chemotherapy, noise-induced hearing loss, etc. And I got tired of seeing problems that I couldn't fix. So that's how I got into studies of pharmacology and developing protective agents. Uh, this is a very rich environment. It's a pleasure to see people like uh, Rita and Tom Ching that are so supportive of innovation, inventorship, uh, intellectual property that understand the issues. Rob and Christy uh, at SIU have been extremely helpful in our technology transfer office. So, uh, as I say, no woman is an island. Uh, but to be in this type of environment it, uh, is very nice uh, to be able to produce these technologies and take them forward. The philosophy at universities, and I've been in medical schools about 30 years now, has really changed towards this. It used to be rather hands-off, we don't work with industry, we don't, uh, and now it's, yes, that is how we get new therapies for patients, and if we are not developing new therapies for patients, what is our research in a medical school all about? But then that's also my personal philosophy. So I'm ver delighted to share this with you. We've had good success. Uh, we are moving forwards. We have moved this off the bench. We have some early stage clinical trials. And uh, we have some very nice support from NIH and Department of Defense. Naturally, we would love to have an uh, industry partner because that's really what you need to take it over the finish line with the FDA. So that said, I uh, just want to have a little technology summary here. I tend to wander when I speak. I hope I don't block anybody. Uh, but first, I started out working with platinum-based chemotherapy-induced hearing loss. Cisplatin chemotherapy causes hearing loss. Over 50% of women with ovarian cancer will have permanent hearing loss as a result of that chemotherapy if they survive. In pursuing this, uh, we have a small-scale phase two back from India, and those patients that were on our drug, it was a double-blinded, placebo-controlled, did not get hearing loss. Okay, it's small-scale. I've been invited to put a proposal into the gynecological oncology group, which is the national consortium for multi-center clinical trials by December 1st. Uh, so I believe that we'll be proceeding to U.S. clinical trials, and then we'll be seeking funding for that. And NIH has, also, has already expressed support. So I think we're going to move that forward. Now, we also have protection from the cortical damage, the chemo brain. Uh, some of the neuropathies, uh, protection from weight loss, that is not complete. Uh, protection from hearing loss is complete, but that is moving forward. We have uh, a reduction in radiation-induced oral mucositis. Patients with head and neck uh, radiation, almost all of them, get radiation-induced oral mucositis, and many times they end up not being able to eat or swallow and on a feeding tube. Very expensive, very miserable, and affects survival. Uh, small scale phase two back from India, we can reduce the incidence of grade three and four, which means not being able to eat or swallow by 50%, okay, which is significant. Uh, we have uh, only animal data right now to reduce aminoglycoside antibiotic induced uh, hearing loss. 
that is a, that's a factor in most patients with moderate severe infections that get immunoglycosides. It's particularly important for cystic fibrosis patients that get re, uh, repeated immunoglycoside exposure. They also lose their vestibular system, their balance many times. But also, uh, we're, I've got clinical trial sites in South Africa, Korea, in conjunction with NIH intramural for patients that are, have resistant strain tuberculosis, worldwide problem. And in that, they all get canamycin and then they almost all lose their hearing. What I'm going to talk about today, though, uh, and focus on is prevention of noise induced hearing loss. Uh, the Department of Defense is funding us for that. Uh, thus far, in our animal studies, with our oral, liquid, orange flavored compound in animals, we can prevent noise induced hearing loss whether we give it before the noise or even starting up to seven hours after the noise exposure. And that's first starting the drug at that time. That's why the Department of Defense is giving us millions for this line of research because that is costing them $4 billion per year for noise induced hearing loss and tinnitus and they want that problem fixed. I told him I could solve that problem for half that, a lousy two billion and I'd be fine. <laughs> uh, but they have given me four million so I really can't complain too hard. I'm having meetings with them again in December, I will bring that up again. Uh, how does this work? It's demethionine is a direct and indirect antioxidant. And if you want details of mechanisms, how this works, I will be glad to bore you over lunch as long as you like. Uh, we have been working out the mechanisms, and Daniel in my lab is now doing his PhD. He's been with me five years. My lab supervisor is with me 20, uh, so that he can focus on the DMET mechanisms more in his research and get him set up to carry forward. We can give it orally, a huge advantage. The Department of Defense is not interested in injectables. They are not interested in round window. They consider that esoteric, unrealistic in a battlefield setting. So they only want oral, so that is what we have been developing. So again, uh, and it doesn't taste too bad. In our initial clinical trials, we tried orange and bubblegum flavor. Bubblegum flavor was spit out. They had never tasted it before. Orange was liked. And also our animals love the orange. They'll laugh it up. Guinea pigs particularly like orange. OK, here's the structure of demethionine. Uh, if anyone's interested, I'll walk you over it. You don't need that. OK. Uh, current developmental status. We have had a, a, an IND approved through the FDA before. That one is actually on a clinical hold because the company that had licensed our patents went under in 2007-2008 financial crisis. A group of professors spent off University of Michigan, wonderful scientists, not too many financiers survived that. Over 50% of biotechs went under. So we're looking for another licensure partner. They're cooperative, we're on great terms, we share, uh, but they just couldn't go forward anymore financially. Uh, we have phase two clinical trials manuscripts for the cis plat motor, uh, protection phase two that I talked about. The phase one is published uh, and the mucositis, and we need to work on that. After their company collapsed, they went back to their professorships and they just haven't gotten the manuscripts out yet. So, and I'm probably a little remiss too. So we want to get those out. We are funded. We are the only group in the United States funded to do clinical trials with the Department of Defense for an odor protective agent for noise-induced hearing loss right now. We're the only ones at the clinical trial site. We're the only ones funded to do that. Uh, so we're very pleased about that. Our IND is in progress. As an audiologist by training, uh, I've learned by working with pharmaceutical companies as a consultant over the years this process. But even with that background, I wasn't quite prepared for all the delays that you've been run into in getting the drugs formulated and getting the FDA approval and, and reviewing the talks and working with the FDA agent. So we're a little slower than what I would like. Uh, I would like it done yesterday. But we should be filing our IND about January 1st. Okay, and then I don't, I'm not anticipating problems, but our clinical trial site is ready. We are funded for it. We have the money in the bank, so we will be going forward. We always need further bench work, always. Um, and we want to get more into mechanisms, and I'm also hiring somebody to help with the clinical trials, a PhD in audiology, and we'll get here helping on the clinical trials because we're a little busy. We have uh, our current funding, I won't walk you through all these grants, NIH and DOD, uh, we're also starting a little industry contract for another little spin-off project right now, and I'm waiting to hear about another international grant from England. I guess we'll find out on Monday. Uh, but right now, our total is over $6 million, and that's current funding. That's not historic, that is current funding right now. 
So it's not the $2.2 billion impact that Rita was talking about, but again, a million here, a million there, it adds up to real money at some point. But for our lab, that keeps us, that keeps us busy and we're very pleased to have it. We would love to have a licensure partner. Competition, right now, no drug is FDA approved to prevent any type of hearing loss. Okay, this is wide open. Uh, and uh, in any of those areas that we're working in. And uh, we're just gonna talk about noise-induced hearing loss today, but again, it's wide open. So there's really no competition out there right now. There's a couple that have been tested. N-acetylcysteine was tested in uh, marine populations. It didn't work, but I can tell you why. Uh, but uh, there's a couple others that are, there's one that is being tested and it can only be given to the round window. So you actually have to go through the tympanic membrane to the round window each time you want to treat them for noise induced hearing loss. They can tell the Marines they have to do that. I have not. Uh, we want something oral and liquid and easy. Okay. ACE Magnesium is approaching clinical trials. I'm actually the audiology coordinator for that project. That technology is out of the University of Michigan. Uh, we set it up in Sweden, Spain, Florida. Again, they don't have connections with the DOD for that yet. That may or may not, it was working well in animals, uh, but you can't give it to everybody. You can't give it to smokers because of the beta carotene. It can increase, increase the risk of lung cancer. And as you all know from the news in the last couple of weeks, high dosage of vitamin E, which is exactly uh, the level in that formulation, can increase the risk of prostate cancer. So as a short-term therapy, it might work long time in our military populations, there may be some increase of risk. So I, again, we probably won't come up with a panacea that works for everybody. Um, I think that has a role, that's why I'm helping them. I think it looks good. I think the DMED is stronger, the protection's a little stronger, and I think it's a little safer. Epsilon, it is approaching clinical trials. I'm, and again, I can go through the competing technologies for you but you have to give that for 14 days to get much protection from a single noise exposure. So for people that are in repeated noise exposures, I don't know how good that's gonna be. And also it contains a lot of selenium, which can be toxic at high levels. So there's some issues there. NAC did not work, so I think that's off the charts. In fact, uh, the Department of Defense has said it's not pursuing it anymore. They funded two large clinical trials that didn't work, it's off the charts. So right now we're the only ones going forward. Again, the market noise-induced hearing loss, leading cause of, of hearing loss worldwide. The military population is perfect because we can test in 600 drill sergeant instructor trainees. They fire precisely 500 rounds of M16 weapon fire in a two-week period, and 38% of them have permanent threshold shift as a result specifically of those two weeks of training. It's a wonderful test population. But should we get approved for noise-induced hearing loss, the implications are for industry, of course, any type of noise exposure. And since we can give it afterwards, you go to a concert, you come out with ringing in your ears, a uh, shift in your hearing, <coughs> stop by the drugstore, possibly pick it up, and, and uh, you might be good. We hope so, okay? Or your car airbag deploys, all these things that can cause hearing loss unexpectedly. So, which, is, which was not the case when I first started working on this, prevention of noise-induced hearing loss is now the top research priority of the Department of Defense, that and blast injury. They have just started the Center for Excellence in Hearing Research, actually the Center for Excellence in Hearing and Research is the subsidiary of that, and that is all branches of the armed forces that is just starting up, and they are bringing it by invitation for those of us that have uh, order protective agents that are a possibility at a special conference December 1st and 2nd. Uh, so it tells you their priority right now. But um, again, the funding from them is uh, very good and I think it's gonna continue to be good. So the potential value of novel order protectants for noise-induced hearing loss right now is 1.9 billion per year, according to RNID, the International uh, Research Organization for Hearing. So I think there will be an excellent market for this. And again, right now there's just no competition. There's nothing approved. Okay. Intellectual property protection is pretty sound. We've got five US patents issued and a variety of foreign patents. If you're interested in that, I'll refer you to Rob because he's our tech transfer expert and patent attorney. And so he can fill you in on that. So I want to show you a little bit. You know, I'm a scientist and this is, I want to show you why we're excited, okay? The samples of our published data. Okay. 
We use chinchillas. Chinchillas have hearing like the human. Okay, they were created for research, in my opinion. Uh, unlike most rodents that have a high frequency range of hearing, chinchillas have precisely the same frequency range as human hearing and the same sensitivity. You can't use them for the chemotherapy studies because they're a Peruvian desert animal with very poor renal clearance, so they don't clear out the chemotherapy drugs, so you kill them before you get hearing loss. And, but for noise, it works great. You can noise expose them and test your protective agents, and they're pretty easy to work with. So I started out working, this was on an NIH grant that I had with the US Navy at the time, and uh, so the Navy got first authorship, but that's fine. Uh, we did a chinchilla model, 105 dB uh, SPL noise band centered at 4K, and which is not an unrealistic noise exposure by any means. Uh, and we used, and we actually tested with Alcar. I'm going to talk about the demethionine today because it works so well. But we started this 12 hour every uh, every 12 hours, starting 48 hours prior to the noise, did it just before the noise, and again continued for two days. We don't need to do that, actually, for subject care, but you always want to maximize your opportunity. <coughs> Research said that time, it said you can give it an hour before the noise, an hour after, and, you're, and you still have pretty full protection. Okay, just to walk you through. Controls are the, but this is basically how much hearing loss they got, okay, at the different frequencies of hearing. Noise-induced hearing loss primarily causes a high-frequency hearing loss. So that's why these people will say, I can hear, but I can't understand. Raising your voice doesn't help much because they lose the consonant sounds, particularly the unvoiced consonant sounds. If you put your hand on your larynx and go, you can't make those any louder because there's no laryngeal involvement. Where A, E, I, O, U are low frequency, plus they're loud anyway. So when you make your voice louder for a hearing impaired person, you're usually not helping them out much, okay? Because you're making the vowels louder that they already hear, and you can't make the consonants much louder. So, that's just going to go through the high frequencies. So here's the black bars are controlled. So zero weeks, temporary threshold shift. We didn't get good protection from that in this study. So other people have. Sometimes you get protection from temporary threshold shift with this compound, sometimes not. I'm not sure. I think it's our testing interval time, which varies. However, at one week, we start to see that those that got the methionine, demethionine, specifically the D isomer, the mirror image of the L isomer, <coughs> that starts to go down. And here, and if we go all the way out here to three weeks, I'll use my digital biologic pointer since I don't bring my laser. Uh, we have, that is with that actually test retest. So with the methionine, we do not have significant threshold shift from baseline. And without the methionine, we certainly did. Okay. Hair cells. In the cochlea, your little transmitters between, uh, sound goes in, moves your eardrum and goes down the acicular chain, the bones, and moves the fluid in your ear. There's little cilia, actually, what we call hair cells, and that transmits and activates the nerve. Okay, those break away and die with noise exposure or the drug exposure, for that matter. So we're looking at these connections here. There's inner and outer hair cells. Outer hair cells are critical, okay? This is with the methionine. This is without, okay? So you don't need to be an audiologist or a um, know a lot about histology. They're present here and they're gone here is the bottom line. Okay, and that is at 21 days, so this is permanent. So we have pretty well 100% outer hair cell protection. And that's not our best sample, that is typical, and that's been replicated all over the world. China, Japan, Germany, Sweden, you name it. Okay, a little different way of looking at it graphically. Inner hair cells, you don't lose those as quickly. Black line without the demethionine. This is with the methionine. Outer hair, inner hair cell loss going up on the graph. Virtually no loss here. Outer hair cells, you lose over 50% of the hair cells in the high frequency region without protection, with protection, almost complete protection. There's a little glitch there. And actually, I can show you the one animal that did that. Stinker. <laughs> yeah. I do. Oh, this one. I'm not usually technology challenged, maybe so. The other way? No? I just want to be sure I don't do laser surgery on somebody's eyes out there. Okay. So now, uh, post-noise rescue. 
we can start it up to seven hours after the exposure. Okay, because the soldier might not have it in his pocket, especially if it's special ops. That's a real concern. Every ounce you add to those packs is a problem for special ops. Uh, so we wanted to see, could we wait? Because theoretically we can. When you give a single noise exposure to the ear, the free radical formation, this is largely an antioxidant, direct and indirect, continues for a minimum of five days after that noise exposure. It keeps going. In fact, I'm pretty sure it goes out longer than that, but I haven't had time to test it. So you have an opportunity to intervene. Okay, it's gonna work better if you give it in advance, but you can get those electron donors in there later while those free radicals are still forming for days after. Okay, that was our theory. Does that work? Indeed it does. So we used our same noise exposure here, 4K octave band to noise, DMET, uh, and we did start it. This one is just one hour after the noise exposure. Okay. Again, hearing loss going up. This is more hearing loss up here. 2K, 4K, this is where you get that noise notch, that high frequency. This is where you have stuh right in here. And down here, this is less than 5 dB. That is less than test regress, okay? And this is significant 0.05 level. We published this in hearing research. No hearing loss at all in the hemothionine animals. Substantial hearing loss in those that got the placebo. And we actually found that seven hours, if we wait seven hours, it looks much the same. A little weaker, you know, a little bit more variable, so I'm not sure if it's breaking down. So now the uh, Department of Defense has given us another um, 1.2 billion. In fact, I've done your work with the engineering department because they're going to try some different noise exposures. They're doing an M16 weapon simulation and post noise exposure system for me. Engineering department here is great to work with, by the way, uh, to develop that system for me off our grant. And so now we're going to see how long can we delay and what is our dosage level. Because when we go to the FDA on these clinical trials with the DOD, the FDA's next question is going to be okay, what is your lowest maximally effective dose? So we're starting out with a relatively high dose, a safe dose for proof of concept in our humans, and then we're going to work it down. So anyhow, here's for more information, we've got a booth. I'm easy to find. Uh, so feel free to contact us. I'd be happy to talk to you about the other areas if you're more interested in the chemotherapy protection, if you're more interested in radiation and mucositis or the immunoglycoside protection. We're happy to talk about all those. I just thought for a short lecture, we probably wanted to focus on one thing. But uh, again, thanks to the generous help of NIH and the Department of Defense. Uh, we have been able to carry on this research, and uh, we're thrilled about it. So I'm also thrilled to be talking to you. Thank you for your patience and time. And it's lovely to see the people that are the risk takers and innovators and financiers, uh, which is not my area of expertise. <laughs> so everybody's got their thing. Thank you so much for this question. We do have time for one or two questions. Okay. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry, do you want, did you want to handle the questions, Jeff, or shall I? Okay. So next time I hear a loud noise, worry about my hearing, how much methionine should I take? Well, okay, it, it, it actually uh, is present in food stuff, and you specifically want the de-isomer. Uh, methionine is a large component of protein, uh, 36 milligrams per gram of protein, and uh, the de-isomer is present particularly in fermented proteins, so you want to take your cheese and yogurt. Now, being the fun gal that I am, I did actually do the calculations for what would a dose of cheese would it take for a woman with ovarian cancer just prior to each round, and it's 5.5 pounds of cheese. Uh, so for, a, nause for a, a, a nauseated patient with emesis, that did not sound like a good plan, where we can concentrate this down to a teaspoonful of an orange-flavored syrup. Uh, but you, you hear about the health benefits of some cheese, yogurt, uh, fermented proteins, particularly in is that it, it might be partially due to that, but again, to get those concentrated doses you need, it's really not going to happen. And also, the soldiers were not really receptive to 5.5 pounds of cheese, <laughs> even though they really are protein eaters. Yes? Yes, Rob? Can you comment on how the concept of the award is healthier? Oh, concept development award is absolutely huge. This, the clinical trials with the military would not be happening. Uh, we have concept development awards, and um, I know that uh, I also collaborated with the University of Florida on some research. I was down talking to their technology transfer department some years ago, and they said, oh, if you were here as an inventor, we could just give you money to you know, see new inventions and that sort of thing. So I was fussing at our university. Well, I don't know, 
if I already have it. And so uh, Rob's office was very good about coming forward with this, Linda Tolt, very uh, supportive, et cetera. So naturally, as soon as the money was out there, I applied for it. And uh, one of the concept developments award I got was specifically to try to set up the clinical trials with the Department of Defense. That money funded me to go out to Fort Jackson to meet with all the personnel uh, and also some of the animal studies, especially some of the rescue studies that convinced the DOD that, gee, this could really be useful to them. Uh, and if I had not had the money to travel to Fort Jackson and personally meet with these people and to get the extra animal data, this wouldn't be happening. So that seed money, I can't remember, was that one 7,500 or 15,000? Uh, has we, uh, pardon? I think there were two 7,500. Okay, so yeah, there were two 7,500 once I, of course I applied again the next year. 15,000 uh, has leveraged over four million in DOD funding. So it was a, I, I hope you guys think it was a good investment, I thought so. I always, I always told them, you won't lose money, just give it to me, I promise you I'll pay you back more, okay? You have to be good on your word. Anything else? Yes, John. Okay, the, 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 the L Okay. The L-methionine works, okay? But the reason you want the D-isomer is that in humans, unlike any other species, monkeys are a little bit similar to humans, which we don't want to hear of it, but unlike rodents and everything else, the D-methionine is metabolized very differently. If you take in a lot of D-methionine, you will largely excrete it, but it can donate electrons in the process. Now that's a good thing because the L that means that the toxicity profile of somebody really overdoses is much less for the D-isomer than for the L-isomer because it's much less bioactive. In fact, I'm just writing up my species comparisons and the DL comparisons for our FDA submission right now. But will the L-methionine work? Yes. But from a safety standpoint, you really want the D-isomer plus it stays in the system longer and is available. I think it was just made to be a protective agent, to be honest. So the L-methionine, so if you hear about oh, methionine is toxic or whatever, in rats, it is. Uh, in humans, a, a severe overdose of the L-methionine can be toxic, D-methionine not so much. So it's really a safety thing that I went to and just kind of a practical issue for it. Yeah? How, how easy is it to purify Well, actually, we, we haven't had a problem. But, but I shouldn't say that. We had a little delay on getting our IND ready. You ask great questions. Uh, because we had a little trouble getting our API formulation, which is under GMP formulation for the FDA submission for our formulation. There was a little bit of a delay. Because people make L-methionine, they make the racemate, but they don't make the D-methionine because it's not approved by the FDA for any purpose. Okay, it should be. I think we will get it approved. Uh, but because of that, it's a little slow getting the API. So it's not difficult. But because it's largely a fermentation process, it takes a little time. So where I would have liked to have had it six months ago, okay, I'd like to have everything six months ago, but uh, we won't have it now uh, because you have to submit a 30-day sample with your IND to the FDA. So that's why we're held up till January 1st, otherwise we'd have our IND filed by now. So, it, but it's not difficult. You know, we have 100 kilograms of it now already in the country under GMP. So we've gotten it. Just that the company that made us for us before was no longer making it because we'd stopped our clinical trials and they were making it specifically for us. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Dr. Campbell. You know, as you were talking, I couldn't.